when a local dentist is found brutally murdered in his home. Everyone is shocked. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, we really don't want to see this. The police suspect his closest friends. Now, all of a sudden, we're under a light for everybody to watch our every move. Until a pair of psychic sisters share a disturbing vision. I felt a lot of blood pooling around my feet. And I had a flash of a bat. And all of a sudden, these spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. Blairsville, Pennsylvania, an hour's drive from Pittsburgh, a factory town which once turned out the steel and glass that helped build America. This is small town USA, where life is comfortable and safe. At least that's what everyone thought, until a spring day in 2006. On the afternoon of April 13th, a teenaged boy makes a shocking discovery at his next door neighbor's house. He was so upset, and I'm like, what is wrong? What is wrong? I thought maybe Zachary got hurt or what have you. He's like, you have to come now. It's John. He's dead. Melissa Yuse's neighbor is Dr. John Yelenick, a local dentist. She immediately calls 911. When I walk up to the door, I saw there was blood on the outside of the door and the window. And right inside the foyer, there was blood all over the floor, all over the walls, all over the floor. In the living room, Lydic discovers a man's body lying in a pool of blood, his throat slashed from ear to ear. Immediately, I knew that it had to be a homicide. No one could have done that to themselves. Corporal Janelle Lydic has been with the Blairsville police for six years. But this is her first homicide. It just looked like there was a violent struggle and there's just blood that went everywhere. She immediately calls in the Pittsburgh FBI to help collect forensic evidence. Throughout the house, the killer has left a trail of blood. There were footprints going out through the living room, through the dining room, out the back door. The footprints may belong to the killer but he's wiped his fingerprints clean. Investigators notice there is no sign of forced entry. Nothing of value appears to be missing. Yelnik's four guns, stored upstairs, remain undisturbed. Corporal Lydic verifies that the crime scene hasn't been contaminated. Everybody who was on scene, I had them give me their shoes, and we made shoe prints of what they had on before they would even, I would even let them leave. And we compared them to the shoe prints that were found going through the dining room and kitchen, and none of them matched. The victim's hands are bagged to preserve any trace evidence under his fingernails. As the crime scene is photographed, the police conduct an exhaustive search of the victim's house and neighborhood in hopes of turning up more clues. We sealed off the area as far as you could see or hear and we I had officers walk up and down roads um, look in the areas of like the grassy areas of bushes everywhere to see if we could find any kind of murder weapon we searched the entire house and we just were unable to find any kind of, any type of murder weapon outside Blairsville is in a state of shock The word had already started to get out, and people were coming to find out what was going on. One of those people is the victim's cousin, Marianne Clark. And as I got to his house, I asked, you know, I wanted to go in. And they said, you can't go in. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, well, he's been murdered. And you really don't want to see this. Melissa Use, John's next door neighbor, has been his friend since the ninth grade. He was an awesome guy. 
He was a awesome father who loved his son very much. He was a good neighbor, and he also made a difference in our community. John was probably the kindest, most gentle, generous, fun-loving person you would ever meet. If you met John, you loved John. John Yelenik had recently moved back to the neighborhood after splitting with his wife of nine years. The divorce was a really bitter divorce. Um, every time they would get close to a settlement, Michelle always wanted something more. Including custody of their nine-year-old son. But after five long years, Michelle and John finally agreed to a settlement. John finally saw an end to this dark tunnel that he was going through. But John never got a chance to sign the papers. I don't think anyone in Blairsville had any idea that this could be anything other than random. There was no reason for John Yelnick to be murdered. Jennifer Mealy follows the sensational story for the local television news. That's when you saw the neighbors start to lock their doors at night, something they'd never done before, keeping their porch lights on and watching things a little more closely. Living right beside the, uh, John's house, my kids were terrified. We didn't sleep for, I, I bet, over a week. We were just so scared to be in our home. In the days following the chilling crime, the police canvassed the area. A neighbor reports hearing two men fighting about money in the pre-dawn hours. This casts a new light on evidence found at the scene, evidence pointing directly at the victim's next-door neighbors, the Uses, the family who first raised the alarm. We were on the uh, coffee table. We found a check that was made out from the Uses to Mr. Yelnick. They didn't want him to cash it yet. So Mr. Hughes was a suspect. He was, um, I guess, a person of interest is how we call it. Police take the victim's neighbors in for questioning and grill them about the uncashed check. I was going to open a bakery here in Blairsville, and John had given me um, $15,000 to help open my bakery. But Melissa says he asked for the money back suddenly, saying he needed it to make a tax payment. And I wrote him a check. I said, I only have 14000 at this time, and then I'll get you the, the other 1000 within the next couple weeks. The police aren't convinced by the story. Not only were we losing a dear friend of ours, but now we were actually being considered as somebody that could have done this horrible crime to him. With her husband now a prime suspect, Melissa is desperate to prove his innocence. A month after the murder, she visits two psychic sisters in search of answers. Hosts of a regular psychic tea party, Suzanne and Jean Vincent claim to be guided by the spirits of the dead. My psychic insights come to me in a variety of different ways. I start seeing flashes of light. I start seeing uh, scenery and images. I might uh, hear or taste something that would all be symbolic to what is this person um, all about or what is the situation all about. And I also have a spirit guide who uh, accompanies me during a uh, psychic session. I see a uh, picture of him that kind of emerges, kind of like a negative, and he gives me these uh, images and these visions uh, of the people that I'm trying to uh, communicate with on the other side. Melissa tells the psychic pair nothing about the murder. And the first thing my spirit guide said to me was there was a grief cloud all around this lady. I just said, oh my goodness, your boys found a, uh, a, a body? And she had said, yes, they did. The uh, energy around her was saying that someone might even suspect her husband of doing this gruesome crime of killing this neighbor. I was just simply amazed on what they, they could see that was going on with our family. The psychics have seen the murder of John Yelenik, but can they find his killer? Melissa just kind of casually said, well, who do you think uh, killed my neighbor? And all of a sudden, immediately, the spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. When 39-year-old dentist John Yelenik is murdered, his neighbors become suspects. Desperate, they turn to a pair of clairvoyant sisters who say the real killer works in law enforcement. 
I called uh, Suzanne and Jean and asked them if they would be interested in coming to Blairsville to do a reading over in John's house. They agree. Three months after the killing, they visit the crime scene. As I was going to the backyard, I was feeling a very strong pull that the person who had done this to John had parked in the back. I had a vision of a maroonish, reddish SUV stalking John Yelnick's house. Hoping that the psychics can help to solve his murder, John's family has given the group permission to enter the house. No longer a restricted crime scene, inside little has changed since the murder. Blood, though faded, is still visible. I was immediately pulled to the dining room and I looked right down and I said, whatever happened, happened right here. The energy was very heavy and thick. I was seeing stab wounds. I had seen his neck like jagged and then a straight line. Um, I also felt a lot of blood pooling and pooling around my feet. Then, Jean claims to see the killer. John's spirit had drawn me to a shoe print and as I put my hand over it, I start seeing a person with red hair, someone with light eyes, fair complexion, freckles, and had a flash of a badge. And all of a sudden, these spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. John saying, he killed me. Melissa is stunned. I knew in my heart who I thought had committed this crime and how much it resembled that person. And the details were just overwhelming. That person is Kevin Foley. He's been dating John Yelenick's ex-wife for two years. He has red hair and drives an SUV. And he's a state trooper. He was already the person of interest because he was the boyfriend of John Yelenick's ex-wife. But the fact that he was a trooper made it difficult to believe that even somebody would do that. But it also made me think that he wouldn't have messed up and he wouldn't have left footprints. But once I got the psychic's information, you know, we wanted to look into it a little bit more. Police discover that there had been bad blood between John Yelenick and Kevin Foley. John Yelenick had frequent arguments with his ex-wife, Michelle. So John Yelnick and Kevin would have words, even to the point where the police were called. The trouble is, Foley is a fellow officer, and they have to tread carefully. And their hands are tied while they await results of the blood and the DNA evidence. That was taking the longest. It was like excruciating for the, not only the public, but for us. In the meantime, analysis of the bloody shoe print has eliminated one suspect. Tom Hughes wears a shoe of full three sizes larger than the killer's. It was a relief to know that Tom was cleared of being a suspect at that point. Her family name cleared, Melissa wants police to meet with the psychics. I was very skeptical of psychics, but I said I would go. I said I would, you know, go down to the house and keep it in the back of my mind that maybe it would work, maybe it would help. Four months after the death of John Yelenick, the Vincent sisters meet the Blairsville police at the murdered dentist's home. They gave me information about a reddish colored SUV. I was taken back. Kevin Foley drives a maroon colored SUV type vehicle. As we were walking through the kitchen, uh, John's spirit yelled out and said, pay close attention to the footprints. It appeared to me that it was an expensive running shoe. And also, I could tell the size. It was like a, maybe a size 10. There's no way they could have known that. There's no, I mean, even if they got a tape measure, there's no way they could have known it because it was faded by that. The psychics offer a prediction. The killer did leave evidence at the crime scene. Evidence they believe will be his downfall. John Yelnick has DNA of the killer underneath his fingernails. And we told the police, you need to pursue this. 
Would the long-awaited DNA results be the key to the case? Then, a final perplexing revelation. Over the footprint, I had a flash of dog tags. Whoever had these dog tags helped kill John Yelnick. This person has a military background. The psychics have given the police more to look into. But will their clues lead the police to the evidence they need to arrest one of their own? Four months have passed since the murder of dentist John Yelenik. The police suspect a state trooper is the killer. Their suspicions are confirmed by two psychic sisters who offer more clues. And the psychics actually gave us things to work on, you know, the dog tags, the military, uh, the SUV, and the footprints. The psychics say their vision of dog tags means the killer has a connection to the military. I was sort of skeptical about that, thinking that, yeah, they got the car right, they got the possible trooper right, but he wasn't in the military. He didn't have dog tags. We looked into it further, and indeed, he did have a military background. The police ramp up their investigation into the state trooper and make a damning discovery. We found video evidence from local gas stations that Kevin Foley was driving through town. He didn't have to travel through Blairsville to get back home, and yet he did. Kevin Foley had means, he had motive, and now it's clear he had opportunity. But police still don't have enough hard evidence to make an arrest, and Foley's not talking. He's hired a lawyer. We were unable to get to Trooper Kevin Foley. He was not cooperating with us, so we requested the state attorney general's office to step in and assist us in investigating the crime. A local police department, like the Blairsville Police Department, does not have the resources or the manpower to investigate a murder for months or years on end. So it became quite apparent that they were going to need help. The concern was, should they call in the state police to investigate this, considering one of their prime suspects was a state police trooper? And that's why both the state police and Blairsville Police agreed that an independent agency needed to be brought in to investigate this, hence the Attorney General. This was a very circumstantial case. Uh, this wasn't a case with a confession uh, or with an eyewitness. So it had to be built piece by piece. Deputy Attorney General Anthony Krasdick brings some much needed muscle to the case. One of the key pieces of evidence in this case certainly were the bloody shoe prints. This was a shoe print made from a ASICS Gel Creed or Gel Creed Plus between a size 10 and a 12 and a half. Only 25,000 pairs were ever sold in America. Krasdick learns that Kevin Foley owns a pair. That company had a discount for officers. Kevin Foley was one of their best customers. Uh, he, he bought a lot of things from them, including the exact size and make that could have made those shoe impressions. While there's mounting circumstantial evidence pointing to Kevin Foley, there's still nothing to place him directly at the crime scene. And then... The DNA results came back and showed that there was a match to Kevin Foley. Kevin Foley's DNA had been trapped underneath his victim's fingernails, just as the psychics predicted. 17 months after the murder of the Blairsville dentist, the police finally arrest Trooper Kevin Foley. There was shock throughout the community. Half the community didn't want to believe, couldn't believe, that a state trooper could actually commit a murder. The other half had no doubt it was him. This was a year and a half long investigation. Clearly, this wasn't going to be simple. This wasn't going to be an easy conviction. The preliminary hearing itself, where the police have to lay out all the evidence they have against a suspect, took hours. We weren't even sure it would get that far. We thought perhaps a judge might throw it out right there, but he didn't. At the trial, prosecutors argue that Kevin Foley had ample motive. The jurors found out that Dr. John Yelnick's divorce was just one day away from being finalized. If that happened, Foley's live-in girlfriend, Yelenik's estranged wife, 
would lose $2,500 a month in support. And Foley had another motive. He had it in his mind that John Yelnick was a bad man, a child molester. During Yelnick's bitter divorce, his estranged wife made accusations. She even took John to court. Although he was cleared of all charges, Foley never stopped believing John was a monster. Kevin Foley made no secret of his ill will towards John Yelnick. He just would tell anybody that John Yelnick um, was, a, was, was evil, should be killed, even asked one trooper to help him kill him. The prosecution paints the jury a vivid picture of the events of April 13th. At around 1 a.m., Foley arrived at Yelnick's house and entered through the back door. You know what I'm here for? Get out of my house. Foley attacked Yelenik, slashing him in the face and chest. He pushed Yelenik's head through the front door window, nearly decapitating him in the process. The pathologist testifies it took up to nine minutes for John Yelenik to bleed to death. Throughout the eight-day trial, Foley maintains his innocence. But on March 18, 2009, he's convicted of first-degree murder in the death of John Yelenik. He's sentenced to life in prison with no chance for parole. He is appealing the verdict. He was the most wonderful person in the world. He died the most horrible death. And tonight, this is his night. We love you, John, and we miss you. We're never forgetting. For John's friend and neighbor, Foley's conviction means an end to a nightmare. And she credits the Vincent sisters for their part in solving the case. I believe that the psychics were helpful in this case. I felt like it was just incredible, the information that they knew. What we wanted to do from the very beginning was to make sure that we found out who did this to our friend and make sure that justice was served. 